All right, so let's uh, work through this. I think this is the last question in the energy worksheet. Um, conservation of energy number three. It's a, a kind of a typical question with which we can demonstrate the use of the conservation law strategy. I think you might even have a homework question that is quite similar to this. So, hey, this is another example. So it says a two kilogram block is released uh, four meters, okay, I have this uh, indication here, four meters from a spring that is fixed at the bottom of an inclined plane. Uh, ideal massless spring has a force constant, okay. The plane is inclined at some angle theta. Uh, let me just, I'll be using letter theta for that. Assume that the plane is frictionless, okay. Uh, so I think the question is trying to um, guide us through steps, although it's kind of unnecessary. So if you just want you to answer part B, you can just skip to that. Uh, and in fact, I'll show that to you in a bit. But let's just do, uh, answer in order. It says, what is the kinetic energy of the block when it contacts the spray? So the block is eventually going to come here. Two kilogram mass, travel the four meters to get here. So uh, the very first thing, especially from the moment when you suspect, oh, I think I can use conservation law strategy to work this out. Once uh, you suspect that, then the question you should answer is, what quantity is conserved? And right now, it's super easy. We covered only one quantity that could possibly be conserved. Here, it would be the total and mechanical energy. And once you suspect the total mechanical energy might be conserved, then the question you have to answer is, are there um, non-conservative forces doing network? And so when you consider free body diagram of the block, let me just draw it here, it does have non-conservative forces. It, you know, gravity, conservative, great, don't have to worry about it. But this normal force, it is conservative. But the reason it doesn't do any work is block is moving along the incline, which is perpendicular to normal force. So you're going to see normal force in a lot of situations where um, energy is conserved, uh, but the normal force, a non-conservative force, it doesn't affect the energy conservation because it doesn't end up doing work. Because of this arrangement, when you calculate work done as the normal force vector times the displacement, this ends up being zero because of this perpendicular direction. So we did that answer to the question, no. We know uh, energy is conserved, yes. And once we have that far, then we, um, we are now ready to set up conservation law equation, one that will say total energy in snapshot one is equal to total energy in snapshot two. And uh, we have to decide what are our snapshots. I think it's pretty clear in this case, this is our snapshot one, this is our snapshot two. So we write that. Uh, let me define my uh, y-axis in this way. I'm going to define it such that, that this is y is equal to zero. So I really only have to worry about what is the height of the uh, block initially, and at the end of the sliding, it'll be at zero height. Okay, so with that, I'm going to say my total mechanical energy is mgh for snapshot one, uh, plus the kinetic energy, it's being released from rest, right? So kinetic energy must be zero in the snapshot. When it's slid down to this position, then its gravitational potential energy is zero, we expect it'll be moving uh, at some speed of v, mv squared. Ah, good. So I think the masses cancel. It's the same mass. They cancel. And, oh, wait. Um, <laughs> I don't want to cancel it because I'm not solving for v. They're actually just asking for the kinetic energy. So I think it's already solved. The kinetic energy is equal to the left-hand side, mgh. And I think you got all the numbers to plug in. Uh, mass is two kilogram. G, uh, let me use approximate value 10 meter per second squared so that I can do this calculation without calculator. Uh, 
Oh, oh, you're not quite done because I think if you try to look up H, that's not given anywhere. This formula that they gave you, that's the hypotenuse. That's not the height. So you actually have to write that, you know, consider this triangle that given the hypotenuse of four meters and the angle theta here, this opposite side, you can get it using sine. Sine is the opposite over hypotenuse. So I can say solving that for H, I can say H is equal to uh, four meters, the hypotenuse times the sine of theta. So, uh, so I can put this in for H, that would be 4m times the sine of theta. And lucky us, uh, I happen to know what sine of 30 degrees is. So if this is 30 degrees, then sine of 30 degrees is simply one half. So four meters divided by two, that's two. Um, two meters times 20, 10 is 20, times another two is 40. You have kilogram times meter squared per second squared. And this is the unit of energy that we call joule, 40 J or 40 joule. It's named after a guy who did a lot of work in thermodynamics. Um, there are stuff in thermodynamics named after him. So he did a lot of work involving energy. So, so yeah, that's the kinetic energy of the block when it contacts the spring, uh, 40 joules. And, it, and then it asks, asks, how much does the spring compress as the block is brought to rest? So there's a, um, um, there's a question you should answer, uh, which is, as the spring collides with this uh, piston, is energy conserved? And I think uh, most people here have seen enough collisions, enough uh, bouncing of the ball, that in this bouncing, energy is probably not perfectly conserved. Now, we are still going to use conservation of energy and what authorizes us to do that is this statement in the question text. It says, the ideal massless spring. So uh, for some of the energy to be transferred into the other objects colliding with it, they need to have their own kinetic energy. But if the spring and the whole assembly we assume is massless, then it can't take on any energy, no matter how fast it moves. So. Um, so with that in mind, we are going to say that at this step, energy is conserved. And once the block is in touch with the piston and they are moving kind of together, then uh, as the spring compresses, it slows down. Spring is a conservative force, which means there are still no non-conservative forces doing work. So what everything that we said before, about total mechanical energy being conserved is still correct. From starting from here, and let me draw the snapshot here. So this would be a snapshot of where the box is somewhere here, and the spring has been super compressed. Um, so even in this snapshot, let me call that snapshot three, all the way from snapshot one through three, energy is conserved. So really the only thing I have to do is to set up this conservation law strategy equation again, and just to make sure that we are referring to the right snapshots. Snapshot one, and I guess now snapshot three. So let me draw that. And I think there's uh, some bit of um, work that we have to do. So let's write that in B. What we are looking for is how much did the spring compress? That's the question. And uh, let's write down our conservation law equation. So the conservation law equation is total energy in snapshot one is equal to total energy. This time I think we label this snapshot three. Snapshot three. Okay, we break down these expressions as before. The total energy in snapshot one will be the same as before. MGH and no kinetic energy. And total energy three, I think you still have no kinetic energy because um, we're talking about the uh, how much the spring compress as the block is brought to rest. So at the maximum position, block will be briefly at rest. So we can say the snapshot three also doesn't have any kinetic energy, but it will have spring potential energy in the form of one half K times delta X 
squared. And here's something that uh, has surprised a lot of people. There's a potential energy for you to worry about. It's a matter of how we define your reference. So if I defined my reference so that it's aligned with um, the relaxed or load-free position of the, the spring, then um, so, so this is where we said we are setting our y is equal to zero for purpose of convenience in part A. What you are now going to see is you are going to see the block deep below y is equal to zero. So we have to worry about this, um, this y, uh, let me call it mean because it's going to be the lowest value of height um, uh, in, in the whole setup. So this y mean position that it reaches, that's um, um, one, that's a non-zero, and two, uh, I don't think we know that yet. So let me first write it in. So we already wrote in spring potential energy. Now we have to write in this uh, gravitational potential energy that comes from the difference in height. So I'll say um, this is plus mgy mean. And as I do that, how I understand it is that because this is going to go below y is equal to zero, this is expected to be a negative quantity. And uh, we'll just uh, work with the numbers we get. So, all right, what question did it ask? It asked, uh, how much does the spring compress R? So they are treating delta X as an unknown. Okay, I hope it's uh, just that unknown, although I don't think I'm going to get that. Um, do they even give us mass? Yeah, yeah, mass is two kilograms. Okay, we got mass, we got G, we got H, um, yeah, I think H is just a given, or um, H is derived in terms of the four meters and the uh, cosine, uh, four meters and sine, uh, I think that's all fine. And uh, so one half K, I thought I was given the value of K, yeah. I'm given the spring constant. So uh, delta X, that's, uh, that's I think our first unknown, because we knew M, G, H, K, and uh, delta x is the only quantity that, so far, we can express in terms of other known quantities. Um, so one unknown, given that we have one equation, I'm hoping that that's the only one unknown. But as I'm saying that, I kind of know why mean is also an unknown. So uh, we have one equation, two unknowns, and what that means is we really need additional equations. We have to think through the setup and try to see what information haven't we used. And I think if you're just looking at the question, this is can be a tough question. I don't think I, there's any number here that you can directly use. Uh, the information that you should use is actually a geometric information. You know, imagine plotting this point, this point uh, blown up. So that point to that point, um, this is delta x, and this is... Um, let me call that y mean or minus y mean if we expect y mean to be uh, a negative quantity. And I hope as you stare at this, you see a right triangle. And you can write down this equation that says minus y mean, the opposite side of the angle, is equal to the hypotenuse delta x times the sine of the angle. That's it. That's my second equation. And I think the way I wrote it, my second equation didn't introduce any new unknowns. So I can go ahead and solve it. So uh, what are we solving for? So we are wanting to solve for how much does the spring compress. That is asking for delta x. So um, what I would say is that if you have more than one unknowns and you want one unknown, then counterintuitively, that unknown is the very last unknown you want to solve for. Because whatever I'm solving for right now, I'm going to eliminate it. So what I really should do here is to solve for y min, plug it in here, and then proceed from there. So solving for y min, I just uh, you know move this minus sign over here by multiplying through by minus 1. So when I plug this in, this is the equation I end up with out of equation 1. Let me call it 1b. It's going to be mgh is equal to 
one half k delta x squared and minus from this minus sign mg delta x sine theta so if i did everything right this should be one equation b in terms of only one unknown so uh, we don't know why mean uh, did i not finish oh uh, wait i eliminated what i mean we don't know delta x so i think uh, i can solve for it so in the right hand side i would uh, oh wait um okay so i can solve for it but i have to use quadratic formula because i am seeing that uh, this is squared this is to the power of one and i don't see any nice easy ca uh, cancellation that allows me to avoid using quadratic formula so let me do it uh, i'm gonna put this into standard form standard form is um, uh, in terms of applying quadratic formula it's a x squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero the reason we need a standard form is because that's how i how we all have quadratic formula memorized the value of x that satisfies this is given by um, minus b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac square root of 2a my that hesitation there is it's been a while since i've used this uh because i've been i've been trying to demonstrate use of sage math i think i've done that a lot let me do this one by hand so i'm going to rewrite the equation into the standard form and then apply the quadratic formula so let me rewrite it as one half k delta x squared and i'm basically collecting everything on the right hand side and writing it as on the left hand side um, plus minus mg uh, wait, uh, mg sine theta times delta x, that's my x, um, and I've moved to mgh over, so it's going to be plus minus mgh is equal to zero. So let's write it all out. Uh, we have, um, so I'm what I'm saying is that a delta x that satisfies this equation is given by that formula. So minus b that sounds like a plus mg sine theta uh, plus or minus square root of i'm hoping one of the transfers will be nonsensical b squared so that will be m squared g squared sine squared theta minus four times and then uh, ac a is one half k and c is minus mgh so those minuses cancel and yeah um, so that's the quantity under the square root and you need to divide that by 2a so that would be two times oh so that's just k okay let's uh can i simplify it um let me try to simplify it a little bit. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, combine it in this term, that's going to be mg sine theta divided by k. And let me uh, write down the other fraction, plus minus. And I'm going to absorb k into the square root. So it's going to be k squared. So it will be square root of m squared g squared sine squared theta divided by k squared plus... Um, Oh, k will, well, it's k squared, so it'll cancel one out and then it, there'll be something remaining. Be two times mgh over k. One factor of k having canceled out. So I think as you look at it, you can figure out which of the two signs should it should be. Should it be plus or should it be minus? And I think as you look at it carefully, I hope you will see that minus one work. Because this quantity here, um, that squared is basically this. So that plus this is greater. After you take the square root, that will be greater than this. So, which means that if we, you take the minus sign, the overall delta x that you calculate will be negative, less than zero. And I think in this context, that answer doesn't make sense. So that must be what you are able to obtain if this happened. Um, as the block slid down, it kind of hooked with the 
uh, spring and after compressing it all the way down, then it bounces back. And whatever height it reaches, that would be described by the um, that that would be described by delta x uh, in the negative direction. We don't want that, which is why we are going with the positive sign plus. Um, then, okay, so it's uh, this thing plus that thing doesn't really simplify. You can factor out things like mg, uh, but. Mm, doesn't really simplify, I'll just leave it be. Uh, if you want, you can plug in the numbers to see what the delta x looks like there. I'll leave that for you for your exercise. So as the block continues to move up and down as it oscillates, and the block finally comes to rest and stays at rest, how much is the spring compressed? Uh, so this is the one question where you can't use conservation of energy. I think you have to realize that as it says, the block finally comes to rest and stays at rest. You have to realize, oh, um, the friction that we have been ignoring must have been significant in some sense over a long time period. That friction has taken out total mechanical energy. That's why it stops oscillating. So once you figure that out, then um, it gets to, to answer how much is the spring compressed. That's actually a force analysis question. And it's a little bit sneaky, but to answer part to C, what you have to do is you have to draw the free body diagram of the block resting on the incline being supported by spring. So I think that'll help me draw all the forces. So I'll always have gravity, mg, and because it's on the surface, not accelerating into the surface, there must be normal force, and the uh, normal force is too. So there must be normal force. And to keep it from sliding down anyway, that's the force being provided by spring force. So I think I can leave this for your um, Newton's law standard strategy uh, solving exercise. What I do say is that after you go through the standard strategy and have spring force worked out, what we do say is that that spring force is equal to the, the, or rather the magnitude of the spring force is equal to the spring constant times the delta x, the magnitude of the delta x. So uh, once you have the spring force, then you can solve for delta x that way. That's a part C. It's a bit of a sneaky question again, because it's asking you for force analysis question in an energy con conservation chapter. Um, so how does the total energy of the block compare in B and C? So in C, it's lower. The energy in C is lower than energy in B uh, because as it oscillates uh, back and forth uh, to reach the state in C, it has um, uh, some of the mechanical energy has dissipated into heat through the friction, a uh, work being done by friction force. So, so yeah, energy is total energy of the block without calculating it. I know it should be lower in C, and you can do the calculation and double check.